So first off, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second annual Angler Program Celebration. As we gather this evening, we'd like to review the successes and failures this past year, present to you our strategic planning efforts, showcase our established student businesses, hear from our two keynote speakers, and then enjoy a dessert reception together. This evening is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to bring everyone together involved in the angler experience in one place. It's my great honor to welcome to you and introduce to you tonight our founder, our inspiration, and our advocate, Mr. Paul Angler. Would you please stand? As we start out tonight, I'd also like to introduce to you University of Nebraska President Jim Linder and his wife Karen, Dean Steve Waller and his wife Jessie, NU Foundation Representative Ann Brunts and her husband David, Real Futures Institute Director Chuck Schroeder, as well as advisory board members Ken Green and his wife Trish, Cassie Lapazotis and Jim Krager. Tonight is about sharing the entrepreneurship experience, showcasing our student entrepreneurs, and honoring two trailblazing leaders in agribusiness. Earlier this evening, we were honored, uh, we honored our graduating seniors and reflected on their accomplishments, or more importantly, their future. We are honored to have a gathering of our community tonight that includes students, parents, faculty, administration, advisory board members, Angler alumni, our mentors, and even some future angler entrepreneurs here tonight. We want to take just a few moments of your time and share a journey this past year to shine recognition on the businesses being created by our community of innovators. Tanner Nelson, would you please join me up here? Thank you, Logan. Uh, during the past year, the Angler Executive Committee has worked tirelessly to create in a strategic vision and establish a culture that will assure our mission and vision are accomplished. Ladies and gentlemen, our mission is clear. We're here to empower and build um, enterprises. We strive to create an exhilarating environment that celebrates innovative thinking and prepares angler entrepreneurs for the future of their entrepreneurial endeavors. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone. In fact, it takes a special kind of crazy to be an entrepreneur. And there's six core pillars that we have at the core of, of who we are. We aspire, we have passion, we have courage, we partner with people, and when it comes down to it, we have the grit to fight and to build something that we know will provide value for Nebraska and for the United States and the world as a whole. We strive to bring these values to life each and every day. And when we wake up, those are the things that are on our minds. And part of cementing the importance of these six pillars in our annual business is in our annual business tour that puts a face to face with men and women who have undertaken the great challenge of building an enterprise. And I can speak firsthand of the, the, uh, the importance that that's had um, on our fellow entrepreneurs and how that impacts the future that we do. Nothing beats the lessons learned on the ground. Our trip last year included touring a diverse group of enterprises in Western Nebraska in Northeast Colorado, ranging from Greeley Hatworks to Cattlefax to Republican Financial to Brown Sheep, to the Brown Sheep Company. The next year we have great pleasure to take another business trip through Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa to visit local businesses and learn more from the founders and business managers themselves. We worked hard as an executive committee this summer and as a program to establish a strategic intent that was both measurable and impactful. And thus you have seen our focus, which is to create a venture 50 ventures by 2020. You might have noticed that when you walk in. Uh, that's what we're all about. We want everyone to know um, that at the core of what the Angler program is, is to build, build business ventures. But this is only the beginning, and we are fully aware that the founders of the program and of businesses will face hardship and perhaps even fail, but we will rise again and keep, and keep pushing on, and we will see their aspirations come to a reality. Tonight is the first of what we hope are at least 100 years of celebrating the work of our angler community. Paul, the fire has started in our belly, and the blaze is most certainly to come. I'd like to invite Colin Scheel and Jared Kenobi to the podium to introduce our first round of enterprises.
as Tanner had just mentioned, um, we set the goal of having 50 business ventures by 2020. Today we are here to recognize the businesses that have started to this date. To be a business, you have to have one satisfied paying customer to be able to be considered. First, we will start with our alumni. I ask you all to hold your applause till the end, and as your name is called, come up here as quick as possible so that we can transition through. For our alumni, we have Doug um, Grotran uh, from Johnson, Nebraska with Rusted Steel Enterprises. <clears throat> Jordan Gardner from Lincoln, Nebraska has two businesses with 8020 Smart Fitness and Lumberjacked Creations. Grant Stela with uh, Stela Services here in Lincoln. And Megan Wolf from Kirkland, Washington with Diva Desserts. Now we'll go into our current students that are uh, in our program and that are, have ventures or are building them even more. Kingpin Enterprises by Jeff Hornig of Davie, Nebraska. Curtis Watovic with CW Auction out of Fullerton, Nebraska. AB Chickens, Amber Byrne Heidi out of Howells. Oxbow's Natural Landscape, Aaron Rirucha out of Bellwood, Nebraska. Public Speaker, MC and Beatboxer, Dwayne Taylor here in Lincoln. Look, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Angler. Agribusiness Entrepreneurship Program. <laughs> Hebner Ag Solutions, Matthew Hebner out of Henderson, Nebraska. Sisters Cattle Company, Taylor Buckley from Franklin, Colorado. Treadway Ag, Matt Treadway out of Ashland, Nebraska. J.K. Horseshoeing Services, Jared Kenobi out of Imperial. Mary's Floral, uh, Jacqueline Nelson out of Wallace, Nebraska. Hartman uh, Hydroponics Tomatoes, Spencer Hartman out of Imperial. Duba Crop, Joe Duba out of Wilbur. Laura's Quality Hay, Laura Goretzky from Farwell. Morris Hay Farm, Sam Morris out of Columbus, Nebraska. Creative Encouragers, Larissa Walk out of Hay Center and her partner, Kristen Ryman. Prime Fire Farms, Logan Peters out of Pender. Against the Grain GoPro Videography, Alyssa Dye. Swedberg. Acres, Landon Swedberg out of North Platte, Nebraska. And S Fish Cattle Company, Stephen Fish out of Imperial. And Matthew Grimes out of Minden, Nebraska. Sorry, Matthew. And our next question is, who is, is next? So what I would like to talk about is our startup weekend that the Angler program will be doing this next fall. Um, Startup Weekend will be 48 hours of young entrepreneurs that have the intention to start a business. We will have the opportunity to learn, fail, and explore business ideas. We will, business ideas will be formed, they will be pitched, and we will figure out if they're viable. We will have the opportunity to see market prototypes, 
financial statements, and long-term feasibility for these businesses. Young entrepreneurs will have the experience of fire in the belly. It will be fast-paced, intense, collaborative, and hopefully answer the question of what's next for these students in the Angler Entrepreneurship Program. It will be coming, more information will be coming out after this program. Thank you. And now for the other reason you guys are all here. I am honored to introduce the Angler Lecture Series presenters, Dave Stock and John Miller. This year's lecture will be slightly different from the previous and years past. This will be conversation based and Tom Field, the director of the Angler program, will be the moderator for this event. To introduce Dave and John, we'll have two short videos. Bryce, will you please cue the videos? Stop Sea Farm, this is Kanye. How may I help you? This land was homesteaded in the 1860s. I'm a fifth generation on this farm. My ancestors passed on a uh, very strong uh, conservation and stewardship ethics that have been passed on from uh, generation to generation, and uh, which I'm very proud of. Uh, we produce warm season grasses, uh, native grasses, uh, native to the, uh, to the Midwest, to the Great Plains, and uh, also wildflowers. Uh, we're probably growing around 30 some different kinds of grasses and wildflowers. Uh, we have 1,500 acres uh, that uh, we maintain for seed production. And the facilities uh, that we're in today, uh, we started building in the uh, 70s, late 70s, and have continued to add uh, cleaning facilities and warehouses as the years have gone on. Um, usually around 15 employees uh, that uh, here in the, the Murdoch operation. We, uh, we do our marketing and selling out of these buildings here at Murdoch. Uh, we do our cleaning in these buildings and we do the shipping out of these buildings. So there, there's a lot of things going on in a, in a very small space. I realized early on I needed to be my own boss. Um, I learned a lot from the people that I worked with for uh, growing up and, and uh, took a lot away from, from those experiences of working for other people and uh, felt I wanted to have my own business and uh, was, was had an advantage and my parents were uh, very willing to have me come back and, and uh, start to to come uh, to live out those dreams here, and uh, I think my par my father and I made very good partners. Uh, he made me uh, a, a good manager and uh, made helped me make good decisions to the point where we uh, developed a very successful business. My personal um, uh, roles have been lately is probably the big the big picture stuff. Uh, uh, Thinking about the future, uh, looking towards uh, what's where we're going to go next. Uh, then probably the financial side. I like making decisions. I like taking risk. Um, I'm, a, I think when I was younger, I was a lot better at it. Uh, I was a lot better at uh, uh, keeping balls in the air at one time than I am now. Uh, but uh, right now, I think um, one of my goals is helping other people find their, uh, live out their dreams. And uh, as I look towards the future, that's kind of the stage that I'm in my life is, is, uh, is stepping back and uh, letting the next generation uh, fulfill their dreams. You know, uh, just like uh, I had to do, I had to make some bad decisions on my own. I probably have to be there and let somebody else make some bad decisions on their own. And so that's probably part of, uh, of uh, letting, moving things on to the next generation. I travel around the country. I can be traveling down an interstate and know that this is my grass seed along the interstate. I can go to a state park and know this grass is mine. Uh, it came from our farm. Uh, go to uh, a wildlife habitat and know that is, is from there. And that gives me just great satisfaction to know that uh, was in, 
had a, had a small part in something that could, are going to last for generations. I'm John Miller. I'm the president and founder of Oxbow Animal Health. This is our family farm. I grew up farming here with my dad and uncle. This farmstead is where we raised our four kids. We lived on this farm for 40 years. We got into the hay business because of the potential that I saw in raising premium hay. It becomes an art to know when the conditions are right, to have the, the patience and the perseverance to wait for those conditions to be right. That whole idea of raising premium hay led me to look at the pet market because I knew that I could put a better premium hay in the bag than what I was seeing in the pet stores. And so through that time, uh, I was talking a lot with Pat, my wife, and my mom and dad, who were very, very uh, supportive we were the first ones to come to the market with uh, a premium Timothy grass hay. The timing was just right. The market was looking for a premium food. That's how we got started. The name Oxbow actually comes from the Oxbow Trail. There is a piece of prairie on the Oxbow property where you can actually still feel the wagon ruts from the Oxbow Trail. And so it's really cool to have that history, but also that pioneering aspect of forging ahead and that entrepreneurial spirit. John is a very passionate person who wasn't afraid to take a risk. It's easy for all of us to carry on that torch into the future just by having that inspirational leadership. I hire good people and then I just try to stay out of the way. John was really at the forefront with saying, you know, what do these animals need that's nutritionally right for them versus what's on the market? And that's kind of what drove him to say, hey, I would really want to bring a veterinarian on board to continue to develop that to support it. So what we've really focused on saying is, you know what, let's understand what's nutritionally correct for the animal. How is the animal built to digest and ingest food? What's natural for them to be eating in the wild if they were going to be eating that? And then how can we link that to what products we're offering? It's about being passionate for animals, but also passionate for the owners, because I know if those owners understand what's right for their animal, they want to do what's best. They want their animal to be healthy. Oxbow is a very genuine company. We really, truly do care and really, truly make decisions based on the best interests of pets and the people that care for them. We want to provide our customers with the best. That's what they deserve. It doesn't matter if you're loading a truck or doing paperwork, it's for our customers. The dedication is really what makes me want to be a part of it. Being able to provide a quality product to somebody who needs it, that's what we're here for every day. And we never do anything that is just to have a product on the market. It always needs to have a reason, it always needs to be the best quality with ingredients and quality with packaging and quality with products. It's never a question of if we're going to do that. That's the way that we do it. Our products are going into the mouths of someone's beloved um, companion. Those pets are so important to our customers' lives and therefore important to our lives. We do a lot of rescue work as well as education in the community. We've got numerous charities that we believe in and I just think we've been blessed so it's really important that we share what we've been blessed. All of us want to feel like we've had a positive impact. All of us want to feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. What we do in this little barn on a gravel road in the middle of rural Nebraska improves the lives of animals and caregivers you know, all over the world. Now, can you please help me welcome Dave, John, and Tom to the stage?
Hey guys, today I'm going to be making a video showing you a variety of products that I received from Oxbow. Of course, I just wanted to show you some nice. Looks good. Yeah, you Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're getting everyone seated here. Um, I do want to. We we made one, as is always the case with a wedding. You make one miss on the introductions list. I do want to introduce a great partner of ours. Chuck Hibbert, who runs uh, Extension Outreach in this state, and without he and his professional staff across the state advocating for this program and to bring us the very best young people uh, from Nebraska and surrounding states, we would be hard pressed to move. So Chuck, please uh, know that we're so delighted you're here with us tonight. <laughs> Probably valuable as, as well, since I'm the director, I get to brag just for a quick second. Uh, you saw two videos tonight, I thought they were both awesome. The first one uh, that you saw, Dave's video, was produced by one of our students, Bryce Duskett back here, uh, who is a student uh, who is building a career in this, and so let's recognize Bryce for bringing to us a quality product. <laughs> and Paul, I hope at some point tonight you just sort of turn around and take a look at what's behind you. I don't think we ever thought that we'd get this going quite this fast. But all of us owe a great deal of thanks to this man because he had a vision and he had the courage to give something back. And so all the students who have benefited from Paul's gift, if you'd please rise and thank him uh, for what he's done for you. If you ever get the chance to take the drive down that gravel road that takes you past John and Dave's place, you get introduced to something very interesting about the American dream. Uh, you take the I am off of impossible. The story of Stock Seed Farm and Oxbow Animal Health emerging side by side on that country road is, it, it's made for the movies. Uh, speaks to the role of relationships, community support in weathering the challenges that lie between the idea and actually getting the thing in the air and making it fly. What's it been like to do this great thing you've done, both of you, side by side? That's such a great story. Would you share a little bit with us about that? And then in sharing that, I'd like you to also then take a little bit of time to talk about your introductory remarks, perhaps even introduce your guests. Since I'm the oldest, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, and before I, f I forget, I want to thank Bryce because uh, he did, is it off? It says it's on. Oh, I just need to get it closer. Really close. Okay, I need to get closer. Uh, before I start, I want, before I forget, I want to thank Bryce also. He was, uh, what a great example of uh, an addition to the English program. Okay, we're, um, what a job. It was a joy to work with him, so thank you. I first of all want to introduce my family. <clears throat> uh, I'll start with my wife, Sharon, in the pink. Uh, with me tonight, uh, my brother and my sister-in-law, Daryl and Sharstock, and probably more important, but ne really never ever least is my own father who was able to be here with us tonight. Just about, uh, he's 93, just a few months away from being 94 and uh, we're uh, very honored that he's well enough to be with us tonight. So uh, would you make him feel welcome too? So I guess you want me to talk about myself, is that what you want you to do? That's not one of my favorite things to do, Tom, but uh, we'll, we'll give it a try. Uh, last night, Paul kind of made a point about he told us he wanted us to be funny. And I, 
I hope funny, work, funny looking works because I, <laughs> I'm not sure how funny we're going to be, but uh, we'll give it a try. Uh, so who are you referring to? <laughs> I would never, ever think of you as being funny looking. <laughs> yeah, it is unique, and it's been uh, a very much of an honor to, uh, to live next door to John and his family. Our families go back for many generations, uh, even before that, and uh, so to see a continuation over many years and then to have something uh, that unique side by side, that close together, really is. I don't think John and I really talk about those sort of things, but um, the friendship, uh, the respect, and um, probably how proud I am of him and what he's accomplished there. Um, give me a chance to tell that to you tonight, too. So, uh, We have a very unique business, I think. Uh, stock seed farms is unique. We talked about what we grow. Uh, grass is a wildflower there, but it's, we grow like 30 different flowers and wildflowers and grasses there, but we carry an inventory of over 250 different kinds of grasses, wildflowers, uh, wetland seeds, uh, turf seeds, legumes, grains, cover crops. Um, I'm sure I forgot, left something out but we have a lot of different uh, grasses and seeds. No one company can do it themselves. You have to work together. And we belong to a very unique business, the native grass seed and wildflower business. We all are friendly competitors of what we call ourselves. And so we need each other for each of us to be successful. Um, I am very proud to be a fifth generation Nebraska farmer. Uh, homestead, as we said, was in the 1860s. Uh, stewardship and conservation was always a very important part of our family. Went to Ag College. Uh, we called it Ag College back then, and it was perfectly acceptable to, to say that. And um, my, my first interest was being a plant breeder, but after a couple years decided that was too small, or too narrow, I mean. Uh, to study and started adding um, business courses. Now there was no agribusiness program when I was in school. So we had to develop our own program, started taking that. And uh, so now I, I don't know if I was the first agribusiness student or not, I don't, know, I don't think I can claim that. One of the important things um, that happened to me while I was in college was active in campus organizations and really encourage all of you to do that, but I was in fact even an organization called Campus Y. Campus Y was a service organization that was sponsored by the YMCA uh, here in Lincoln. And from that, uh, my involvement in that was had the uh, privilege of being able to go to Hong Kong between my junior and senior year and um, teach English in, uh, in the Chinese refugee or resettlement areas because they were escaping China, uh, communist China. From that experience of coming from a small town, Cass County, Nebraska boy, I became a world citizen. And from that, uh, pretty much changed my life of how I viewed my world from that point on. I graduated in 69, uh, from there uh, joined the Peace Corps, uh, went to, became an agricultural extensionist uh, in the central Andes of Columbia, South America. Served two years as a volunteer and one year on the staff and which was an invaluable for my training as uh, for the rest of my life. Um, the kind of skills that I developed with that experience are invaluable. Um, making decisions in a different language is something you always remember, but it was uh, an incredible experience and maybe one of the most important uh, lessons I learned there as being a uh, employee of the State Department is I never wanted to work for the government again. <laughs> <laughs> so we returned to the farm um, as a hired man and fell in love with farming again after being out of the country for three years. It was wonderful. But like many from my generation at that time, 
Uh, coming back to the farm uh, was difficult because a lot of us all came back at the same time and there was not land available. And that, therefore, what I'm getting at is this is what was the start of making the decision to start stock seed farms. My father had started growing uh, native grasses in 1956. He acted on his belief in conservation and these grasses were being used for, for pasture and for conservation use. And my idea and my dream was to, to turn this into a business. Start cutting out the middleman. We were raising grass seed for seed companies. And so we said, well, let's start conditioning, growing the seed ourselves and start marketing it ourselves. And that is the beginning of that um, enterprise. We incorporated in 1976, uh, added uh, buildings, uh, cleaning facilities, offices. You saw some of those in the, in the video tonight. And what at, it was a new industry at that time. And uh, there was uh, really not that much improved native grasses available on the market. Most of the seed on the market was from native harvest or pastures. Uh, the seed quality was poor, the germinations were poor, and there was um, unpredictable performance from these seeds. So it was early on that we decided that that's how we were going to position ourselves in the market. We were going to provide the best quality seed that was available. At the same time, there's also another man who uh, was a, one of the first innovators in, in the industry by the name of Jim Wilson, who was a prolific writer and uh, a promoter. And he came up with the idea of people pastures. And his market was to the east of here, uh, using native grasses and wildflowers for habitat, for roadside seedings, uh, for other kinds of uses. And we bought him out. And the main thing we got from him was his writings. And we took and uh, pretty much our catalog were incorporated in his writings, his teachings, because we also decided that the best way for us to be successful was for our customer to be successful. And so we decided besides quality seed, we were gonna become the best educator, that we we're gonna be the place to get the best information. This has been, was just immeasurable. It was, uh, so much of our growth was by word of mouth. Uh, we didn't have all the, all the media that we have today to do that, to do, uh, social media that's available, but it was very su successful for uh, our growth of our company. Uh, we added internet sales at an early stage. We maybe weren't the first one to sell wildflowers on the internet, but we were the first ones to sell native grasses on the internet. Our market has grown to, for many things, it's grown into landscaping and acreages and habitat, golf courses, and now new markets for pollinators and biomass. And we have put a big bet on developing grasses for water, water conserving landscapes, and that's in buffalo grass, turf type buffalo grasses. I don't know if I have time to enter one more thing. Absolutely. I wanted to talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, this, this is about the university, my next part, because of, of how important the university has been to our success. And they've been a partner from the very beginning, from the time that my father started growing these grasses and how uh, the uh, plant breeders at the university were, were guiding him uh, in the growing of these new plants uh, to today. Uh, I think was very beneficial of city today with uh, the Engler uh, program. But about over 20 years ago, uh, four other seed companies, three other seed companies ourselves, uh, started a, seed a native grass seed company, uh, breeding company. And at the time, the University of Nebraska turf program were de was developing buffalo grass for uh, vegetatively. It had a contract from the USGA to develop vegetative buffalo grass for, uh, for golf courses. Um, the four, our four companies decided we wanted to do it for seed. And so we ha had a signed a contract with the university to use their parent material. Uh, to do crosses. We had a plant breeder, we did a, most of the, all the research and development work, and from that we developed, released three different varieties of buffalo grass. In that time, the other seed company in Nebraska, which is Arrow Seed Company from Broken Bow and ourselves, bought our partners out. And from there, we developed a new contract with the University of Nebraska for exclusive rights of all seeded material that came out of the university. And we just released last year our first buffalo grass from that program, which is called Sundancer. 
and we're very proud of, of that joint cooperation with the university to, to do that. Um, I think the one thing, I, point I want to make of, of anything else is we didn't do it by ourselves. We did it with a lot of support, relationships, cooperations, partnerships with a lot of people. And that, uh, that was, the, was the most successful way for our company to grow over this such a long period of time of 40 some years. So, John. I would just like to start by saying I wish you all could have been with Dave and I today while we visited with Angler uh, students. Uh, we interviewed them and we talked about their goals and their projects that they're working on. And it was really inspiring to, to be around these, these young folks. And I, I, if, I wish you could have all been there because it just gives you hope for the future because there's a lot of great kids in this room, and I think they deserve a round of applause. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and since the Angler program is about real life and real business, I want to see Aaron Riruka in the back of the, of the, um, the room to talk about copyright infringement <laughs> at, at <laughs> that name was protected before you were born <laughs> which which is oxbow okay my uh, my company is oxbow animal health but i do really like the name at uh, aaron so uh, and i'm just kidding <laughs> so, uh, this is jumping way ahead of what I was, when I was going to say this, but that video that we showed up here um, was prepared for marketing with PetSmart. And through some of my talk and, and what we stand for is, all, I really, really care about branding, 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 and that is so important to your success in whatever industry that you go into. And um, PetSmart came, well actually PetSmart came to us probably eight or nine years ago and wanted us to be, uh, to put our products in their stores. And we refused at that time because you really don't want to get in bed with an 800 pound gorilla. And so we, were, we wanted to be very careful about having some large chain store. And I think that's a really important thing for people to remember because I've heard, uh, you see news stories about companies who are so excited because they're going in with Walmart or Kmart or whoever. And that can be the kiss of death because you don't want too much of your sales tied up in any one company. And so we uh, put PetSmart off for several years before we finally decided to go with them about six years ago. Well, they have found, and I'm, now I'm giving my sales pitch on brand, um, they did market research on, on Oxbow and the loyalty to our, to our brand, which we have worked so hard to create. And they found that 78% of the people who buy Oxbow food, and for those of you who don't know, we're really niche. We're niche in pet rabbit, pet guinea pig, chinchilla, rats, hamsters, gerbils. And that's where we live and that's where we've been successful, but we work very hard on that brand. And they found that 78% of the people who buy Oxbow always buy Oxbow. And the closest competitor was a competitor at 25%. They have never seen brand loyalty like that before. And thus, 
they want us to put our name on every single thing that we'll agree to put our name onto, then we're in that process of evaluating um, those decisions. But um, that's why that video was created, and it's on PetSmart's website. Uh, now, I think uh, it's just such an honor uh, to be asked to be a part of the Angler Lecture Series. My goodness, we've, I've listened to so many great people present uh, at, at this event, and you know, it's such an honor to be up here with Dave, my neighbor, uh, and my friend um, for many, many years. And Dave was successful and an entrepreneur way before I was, and he has uh, just been um, very helpful to me in, the, in talking through business issues and shipping issues and, and HR issues and all the things that he'd been through uh, long before um, I got there. So it certainly is an honor to be up here with Dave. I do think uh, that Dave and I also share another thing in common in that we're married to the two best looking women in Murdoch. <laughs> and thus, that's my lead into recognizing my wife, Pat. <laughs> I love doing that stuff. <laughs> and she's, she worked side by side with me as we uh, built Oxbow. And, uh, and, you know, we raised four kids on our farm, and she's been extremely busy doing that. And uh, I want to thank her. And now you know why they call me lucky. <laughs> We've got uh, some other guests with us tonight. Craig Bisher, who's a really good friend of mine, who has been very supportive of uh, all of our efforts from those very early days. Craig went to several trade shows with me, and as, when, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing, and one of the trade shows we went to, get this, was the House Rabbit Society. You bet you didn't know that existed. <laughs> 20,000 people belong, belong to them. And it, when I started getting involved with them, I thought, if I can just get 10% of those people, I'm going to be successful. Well, we, Craig and I went to a, one of their conferences out in Berkeley, California. And if any of you know Craig's politics and my politics, and then you think about us being at anything at Berkeley, <laughs> You got to believe that's pretty funny. <laughs> but uh, actually, he and I worked on a couple of different ideas that are good examples of you, not all ideas are good ideas. <laughs> but we, we actually came out with bottled pet water. We actually sold some. <laughs> and. The name was Heartland Springs, and that's trademarked, so you, don't, you can't steal that idea. <laughs> Another idea we had, which I think would have rivaled the pet rock idea, we were going to come out with a bottle of dehydrated water. <laughs> think about it. It's, it's, it's all diet. It's diet. It's all natural. No preservatives. All you got to do is add water, right? <laughs> Well, we didn't actually do that one, but uh, my next guest is uh, Nancy, well, Gary and Nancy Eberly. Uh, Nancy was my first COO, uh, she, and she came on in 2003, and that was really a big moment for Oxbow because until that time, it's, you know, it's my idea, it's, we're doing it my way, we're, we're having all kinds of growth problems. Because actually, I, I operate clear out here at 40,000 feet, okay? And now you've got 30 employees, and you just can't, you can't live out here at 40,000 feet. You've got to have somebody here at 5,000 feet uh, leading the way and, and putting systems and, 
and processes uh, into place to, just to keep the business going. And I knew that time was going to come, but that was a big change in our, um, in our history. And uh, I knew Nancy f through the LEAD program, and everyone who is under, I don't know what it is, 40, and if you're involved in agriculture and you want to be a leader, you need to get into the LEAD program because that is um, a great uh, program to, uh, to learn leadership through. Um, so Nancy came on and did a tremendous job for me for several years, and then she left me for another man, <laughs> Tom Osborne, <laughs> that scoundrel. <laughs> but I forgive him. She, uh, he, when he ran for governor, he asked Nancy to be on his um, campaign staff, and but I've always. I, I love talking to Nancy about the old days and what we've, where, where we came from and where we're at now. And then uh, sitting next to uh, Nancy is Deb Burrow, my current COO, who is uh, just a fantastic lady. And, and again, we've got, I mean, we've been growing between 20 and 35% per year for the last eight years since Nan, uh, Deb's been on board. And that is really, really hard to uh, control and to keep focused and to have your strategic plan in place and then to follow that plan. Because uh, quite a few of our leadership, um, it, it's, well, it's kind of like herding cats. And I think I'm probably the lead cat. And I'm, I'm out here with all kinds of ideas. I'm living at 40,000 feet and she's gotta make it work at 5,000. And uh, she's done a, a great job of, of getting us there. And um, so I, I appreciate both Deb and Nancy. Uh, now, believe it or not, to get to my story. Um, I, grad I, we, I went, came to UNL. I uh, graduated as an ag engineer. Um, I, and then became a petroleum engineer for Amoco and we moved to Riverton, Wyoming for a year and a half. And then my uncle passed away and left this farm uh, vacant. So Pat and I moved back and we were a pretty typical corn, soybean, hog and cattle farm. Um, starting in 73, um, I started to look at the hay business and uh, got, we got into the commercial alfalfa business in 1980, and we named it the Oxbow Hay Company because of what you heard there on the, uh, the film. And, um, and I, I really grew to like the hay business. It's really hard work. It really takes a lot of perseverance, which I have. And um, so I worked hard and actually got to be pretty good at producing premium hay. Um, part of producing premium hay is, is perseverance. And I can't tell you the number of times when I was sitting in the tractor seat waiting for the right conditions for the hay to get right so that you could bale it. And that was usually a combination of dew and wind and then whether the hay was completely dry the day before. And it, so you, it was really, um, took a lot of patience. And many times I watched the sun come up in the morning, sitting on the tractor seat, waiting for the right conditions. And just to show you, a, a, once again, what a St. Pat is, on our 25th anniversary, I was sitting in the tractor seat in, when the sun came up in the morning, waiting for just the right conditions. <laughs> But, so I, you know, I, I really, I became pretty good at the hay business and I knew that uh, I could do, produce a premium uh, product and if I made a premium product, I could probably make a premium return. We, I worked hard at marketing to uh, fancy horse people, to veterinarians, to some dairies, and, and we could make more money per acre uh, with hay 
than we could have been making with corn and soybeans and some of those other commodities because farming wasn't real great during the early 80s and some other times. But so I, how do I add more value to my hay? Well, I started to look at the pet market in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, you know, I'd go to the pet store and I see what was on the shelves and at that time it was only alfalfa. So I, I, I knew that my alfalfa was better than the alfalfa was in those bags, but how in the heck do you get your hay into a little bag and into the, uh, the distribution channels? Um, so part of that process was for about a year and a half, I uh, sold my premium alfalfa to Geisler Pet Products in Omaha. That was a Conagra company at the time. And watched them put my premium hay in their little bag and raise the value of that hay by 2,000%. And pretty soon I got to thinking, I can do that. <laughs> little did I know how hard that was going to be. But um, so I, I had a, a good friend who was in advertising in Omaha, lived close to us. He, he said he'd agree uh, to help create the bag because how, what in the heck do you put on the bag? And um, so he helped me do that. Um, I took the idea to three different uh, Midwest distributors. One was in Milwaukee, one was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and one was in Kansas City. The uh, two in Milwaukee and Cedar Rapids says, well, that's nice hay, but no thanks. Uh, the Stanley Wurtenberger in Kansas City Pet, with Kansas City Pet Supply says, that's a great idea, I'll carry that. And thus, Oxbow Pet Products was born. And if Stanley would have said, that's a stupid idea, Oxbow maybe never would have happened. So I'm, I'm forever thankful to uh, Stanley. Then, so then in, um, I can still remember 1992 delivering two cases of 15 ounce bags of alfalfa to their truck at exit 420, right there on I-80. And uh, we sold $96 worth of pet food in 1992. For a little perspective, so okay, so that's, that was, 70, that was 72 pounds of hay, okay? This year, we're going to package over 4,000 4, ton of Timothy, and we're going to package over 10,000 tons of pellets that are made out of Timothy. So it gives you a little perspective of, of where we've come from. So um, 92 was the birth um, in 94, and we started in our garage, and you might not have noticed, but we had the little uh, handmade stuffing apparatus was, was in the film sitting there, and it was, I, we made it, we C-clamped it to a kitchen table with a long uh, plunger with a long handle on it. You put the hay in this end, you put the bag on the other end, you ram it a few times, you pull out the stopper, and then you push the hay out into the little bag, and we did thousands and thousands of bags that way to get started. Um, so in 90, 94, we moved to my parents' garage, which was bigger. In 96, we came back to our old, back to our own farm, into our old German peg barn. It was built with pegs, and it was built in 1901, and um, which is a point I like to, to bring up to my wife. The bar, our barn was built in 1901, and our house was built in 1904. So at least those people had their priorities right. <laughs> so we, uh, it, so 94 was a big year for us. Um, coming back to the barn, 96 is when we had our very first hydraulic packaging machine created. Um, and then in the year 2000 is when the pet food idea became for real. 
I mean, up until this time, we could have quit. All of our neighbors thought it was a joke. Um, so there was, it was, and it was kind of a joke, and I understand why, but in 2000 is when we built our first new building. We borrowed $150,000 to put up this building, and now the pet food business is for real. There is no turning back. You're not going to stop and do something else. So um, 2000 is a big year. In 2002, we added the next building. In 2007, we added the next building. In 2011, we added the next building. And now we're getting ready to move the whole campus from where we're at on our farm in Murdoch to Southwest Omaha up on the Schramm Road corridor, if any of you are familiar with the uh, development that's going to be happening there. So, you know, our, our growth has just been phenomenal. Um, this is getting long. Part of our branding is that we've always done what is good for the animal. Uh, we've always, and w our timing has been very fortunate with um, the market was just starting to care about these animals. Before we got into it, rabbits and guinea pigs, and they were all throwaway pets. People, you know, they fed them junk. They died in three to four years. and uh, nobody really cared. When we were getting started in 92, people were just, the, you know, the trend that started with humans, and then it goes to dogs, and then it goes to cats, and then it ends up in our species. It was just starting to um, gain traction, and now people were starting to take these pets to the veterinarians, and the veterinarians were seeing all of these overweight problems because and teeth problems because people weren't feeding these animals right. We came along with premium products that was, which were life stage correct um, we, with Timothy grass, Timothy based pellets, they're high fiber, they're low protein, low energy, and thus these animals were now on our products, they're, they're living 10 to 12 years and the veterinarians really came to appreciate us and they actually became our sales force and became our sales force all over the world. So we were going to some early veterinarian conferences um, promoting our products and, and there were vets from all over the world who were seeing these animals and they became our sales force and they pulled us into uh, those markets. In 1998 we sold our first uh, container load of products to Japan in uh, 19, I, I think it was 99, and then it was Hong Kong, and then in 2000 it was uh, Europe. And so we had phenomenal growth uh, just through veterinarians recommending us and pulling us into the market. In 2006, we were named the Small Business Administration uh, National Exporter of the Year, uh, which is, you know, a huge, um, uh, honor to, to be paid to this little company in, on the farm in Murdoch, Nebraska, uh, operating with local folks. And um, so, you know, we, we've had some great things happen to us basically by being true to our brand and, and working hard to build those markets. So, in closing, believe it or not, um, to you kids, stay true to your brand. Um, know, why, know why you're different, why, why you're going to be different, why di differentiate why you're different than uh, your competition. Uh, there's, and there's also market research that shows that people buy why you do something before they buy what you do. So it's really important to 
uh, market, you, you got to have the right mission and you got to have the right products and you got to do it for the right reasons. You've got to market all of those things together. Um, and, then, and my final words is you've got to hire good people. Uh, you've got to have, find good people who can be your friends. You've got to find uh, good people that you can hire and maybe you even have to marry one of them. <laughs> but if you do, you'll be successful. So that's it. We want to take just a little bit of time and explore a couple of the themes that both of you have shared. If I'm 19 and I'm sitting out there and I see these two great videos and I hear these two great stories, I think, Wow, that looked pretty seamless. There had to be times where you thought, this might not work. This is going to be harder than they promised me. What were those times like and what did you do to stay the course? What did it take to stay the course and maybe even who helped you stay the course uh, in those toughest of times? I'll give you a break to catch your breath there a little bit. I, I think probably that started at an early age of learning how to deal with adversity, dealing with those kind of things. Um, for me, it, it was kind of a combination of faith, combination of uh, family, and probably a, a little bit of a sense of community. Uh, of adding those together uh, provided me with a lot of self-confidence to know that, uh, you know, maybe it's really bad now, but it's there's more likely it's going to get better. Uh, I think that has probably uh, been as what's carried me through uh, a lot of situations is faith, family, and friends. Yeah, that couldn't, couldn't have been said any better. Um, and necessity. Uh, we were it was very, very important that we succeed at this uh, or life was going to change dramatically. And um, so it's perseverance and uh, faith, uh, you know, praying for wisdom and guidance in, in the decisions that you make, which we, we still do every day because there's a lot of people depending on us making the right decisions. And so it's just hanging in there. and. Um, you got to hang out with the right people. You don't go to the coffee shop and listen to the naysayers. Um, you got to hang out with the Dave Stocks of the world. So that's how you do it. So in agriculture, we, we have this great set of traditions, which sometimes provide us great foundations and sometimes great anchors uh, that weigh us down. Both of you took commodities hey, and you said, we got to go a different way. There had to be people in your community of hay growers and fellow farmers who heard you start to talk about native seeds and prairies and feeding chinchillas and gerbils who didn't buy in right off, but maybe even were cynical, the doubters, the naysayers, the fear mongers. How did you deal with that in the early stages when everybody was just waiting for you to mess it up? I still are. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that life? Um, yeah, and it is life. You know, it's. You, you just, well, you have to be true to yourself. You know, do what you believe in. Um, work hard, get the help you need. Get, you know, get the, listen to the people that can help you get through this. Because believe me, you young folks, there are gonna be many things that you're not gonna know the answer to. And don't be too proud to go and get the answers 
find people who have been through it, uh, build that network of support people, which is, you know, partly of what I did to, to help us get through the tough times. I, I think John's right. Building those relationships and finding those people. Um, I know early on for me that I was active in the Nebraska Soybean Association and, uh, be, and, and was on the national board. And here you are surrounded by the best soybean producers in the country. And they're all positive. It's like a whole, it was my Engler group, so to speak. And those are exactly, being around those people, surrounding yourself with, with the right people, surrounding yourself with employees who are positive mm -hmm. is, is really important too for, for a successful business. And, and we're lucky to have that. Entrepreneurship is certainly eventually driven by the ability to make a profit, get a product out to market, get uptake, cash flow. But there's more to it than just the money. And if you would, would you share just a little bit about <clears throat> those other themes, motivators, philosophies that inspired you to build these <coughs> great companies side by side that have created value for customers and opportunities for so many people? Well, I always said I could never sell grain augers, not to say there's we need grain augers and, and it's a good way to make a living. But for me, I needed to have something I believed in. And that's just who I am. I knew that early on that that was what was more important to me was uh, what I believed in. Um, I think I mentioned earlier in the talk about our strong commitment to stewardship and conservation. And I'll go back to that again. And I, and I uh, again, I think that goes along with my my faith uh, also enters all in, into all that. So uh, for me, I just really, I mentioned it in the video, is I just uh, receive a lot of uh, personal satisfaction from, um, from knowing that my product is, is something that uh, is making the world better and uh, conserving soil, uh, improving the air quality, uh, making the water cleaner. Uh, and luckily enough, the money seemed to follow that right along. So we were lucky that way I could, could uh, live on some of my uh, principles and uh, still make a living at it. Yeah, I think at Oxbow we have a saying that it's the journey and we all, we've got great teamwork and the thing that is most satisfying to me is my people. My people, my people. And they are, it is so much fun to watch um, young folks from, you know, I don't know, 28 to 42. And, and we've all grown together. We haven't hired anybody some, some high-powered um, person to come in and help us to grow. We've grown together and to watch um, my current uh, director of sales and business development and my director of, of marketing who grew up and lives just, well, she lives on Dave's <laughs> home place. And I mean, that's a whole, there's a whole family uh, involvement there, but just to watch young people grow and learn and have fun and enjoy each other and, and be successful. You've got to be successful. You've got to make money. Um, I'm just so happy to watch that happen. And I'm so thankful that we are finally being successful enough that we're starting to pay some really good wages and uh, numerous people are in six figures and I'm just that I'm just so pleased that Oxbow has allowed that to happen on the farm in Murdoch. Mm -hmm. In business there's a lot of deals, a lot of opportunities, a lot of partners to choose from. 
Uh, some of them are good deals, good partners, good opportunities. Some of them aren't. How, how did you learn to separate which deals, which things to do, how to maybe leave easy money on the table in search of something more aligned with your values? How did you do that? Okay, this is going to sound really trite, but um, in the year 2000, I hired a uh, management consultant who came in and we brought in 20 of our Oxbow employees and we spent over a day do, creating our mission and our vision and, and what we call the paradigm of rights. And the paradigm of rights is doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason in the right way Right, right people, right things, right time, right reasons, right way. And you'd be surprised how often we refer to that when we're trying to make decisions. Because there are a lot of decisions to make. A lot, there's a lot of opportunity out there and it is so easy, especially with my mindset, because I want to go chase everything I can. But so you, you can, you know, you, you take each one of your decisions through those steps and does it make sense and is it the right thing to do? And it just keeps you grounded. So here you are, you've attained a fair bit of success. Uh, the pinnacle, of course, giving the angler a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll never be the same. Yeah. You look back now. Would you do this again? Absolutely. I really cannot think of anything else that I'd rather do. I still enjoy what I do. And uh, so that's an easy question. Yes. Yeah, you know, in a heartbeat. And uh, it, it, so much of it is the journey. And, and not knowing, I, you know, I think entrepreneurs thrive on that risk and not knowing. If you don't want to be an entrepreneur, you can get a job and, and there's nothing wrong with jobs. Hemmons knows I need people who want jobs, but you know, it's, it's the risk. It's wow, what can we do tomorrow? What's up? What about these plans that are six months down the road? And um, it's just that excitement of what can, what can we do? And I mean, I'm just very thankful that it worked. <laughs> well, one last question from me before we give the audience an opportunity. You've got a lot of aspiring young entrepreneurs in this room. Uh, some of them backed by parents who are thinking, there's probably a lot safer way to do this. There's probably a lot less through. There's, got, there's, there's easier ways, guys. But I think there's a lot of burning fires in here. Would you share just a little bit of advice if you could look back and put yourself out there in their shoes and like that Brad Paisley song, write that letter to yourself. What advice would you today give your 18 and 19 year old self We've been kind of talking about some of those things all day long because we've been doing it with the interviews. Uh, it's made John and I really think deeply about uh, a, a lot of the things that you challenged us with today. You asked us a lot of questions and, uh, and we talked about some of those things that, that you need to add yet to your resume. Um, and I don't know if this is exactly what we were talking about, but to me, I think it's very important that you know who you are as a person. And this is a great time of your life that you're growing up in this safe environment. And in the next few years, you really need to know who you are. Uh, both John and I spent time uh, away from the farm. And I think that was, we both feel it's very valuable that we worked for somebody else somebody else besides our fathers. Our fathers became instantly a lot smarter all of a sudden. <laughs> and 
so, uh, but at the same time, it's who you are. And it, my next piece of advice was, uh, who do you want to be? And I think you can also add that to your business. What do you want your business to be? And I think that was would make it a lot easier making those decisions that you're going to be making uh, in the future. And it also might make your parents feel a little more secure if you have a really clear idea of who you are and what you want to be. I agree. Um, and I also think for you young kids, you can't make any mistakes right now. You get out and learn, get out and get a job, do. And I don't think you have to be an entrepreneur right away. There's so much to learn. And so it, it does, almost doesn't matter what you decide to do right now. Um, you're going to learn, if nothing else, you're going to learn what you don't want to do, which is mm -hmm. no small part. And um, learn some skills, learn how other people handle risk, how they, um, how they finance their business. Um, there's so much to learn and you can't you can't make any mistakes right now, so just get out and do it. And you know, you might find something totally different in in a job that this is turning out to be a lot of fun. So it might be totally different than what you think is going to be fun right now. So just get out and and uh, enjoy the journey. I'm going to turn it over to Amber Bernheide now to handle some questions from the audience. Uh, and again, our thanks to all of you for making time uh, to be here tonight and to honor uh, these two great men and the whole spirit of entrepreneurship that drives this state. Well, David, I would have had a great discussion so far about um, how you built your businesses and you've given us great advice of where to go as young entrepreneurs. Now I'm going to open up to the audience um, for a few questions to either ask Dave or John. Mostly John. You know, um, I, I, who knows, it, probably in a bar. Um, it was probably at a trade show or is that a seed meeting? I think uh, when you're involved in, in, in an area of expertise that those like, I think John had mentioned earlier how valuable those are is where you build a lot of relationships around the, around the country. And uh, I know the, uh, the, the Buffalo Grass Breeding Program that we, uh, we formed uh, these were companies we did business with. These were, co these were com competitors. And, uh, but we all had, we were competitors, but we all needed this product. There was, each of us saw a, a need for this product in a different part of our, of the country. And, uh, it, but we all knew that it was too big of a project for one company to do. And that each of us had different resources available to us. But by combining our resources, we lowered our risk and we increased the, the chances of it becoming successful, and that's exactly what happened. Um, how it exactly happened, I'm not sure, but, but we were all, like I said, we all knew each other, we all bought seed from each other, and uh, I guess it was just kind of a, a natural fit that we all came together and uh, formed that company. No, and that's why I buy my hay out of Idaho. Because <laughs> it never rains out there, and they have less than 10 inches of rain and 10% humidity, and they turn on the water to make the hay grow, and they turn off the water to bale the hay. And 
I like that. <laughs> but to go back to your question, I mean, it is, you have to, sp to spread out your risk. You need to find multiple suppliers to make sure that you can take care of your, your customers. So, it, so it's, it is, and weather is a factor everywhere in this country. Are you talking partnership as in business together or partnership as networking? I guess both. So, you know, say I've got Spencer here and we both met in class, in, in a class we got together. And, you know, we, we can talk, we can sit down for coffee and say, okay, we're friends. And I know that he's got a business and I've got a business and we want to help each other grow. But neither of us are, you know, already here, but we want to get there. How does that process work, or how would you advise us through that process to be successful? That's a very important question. Well, I think the networking is absolutely critical, and I think your, or your um, Angler alumni is working towards um, yeah. that networking mm -hmm. support. You cannot do that enough. Now, when you start to consider people for partners and now you are sharing responsibility and risk that's a, a whole n another ball game mm -hmm. and you want to be real sure that that is perfectly understood what the arrangement is what the risk is now uh, one of my points i brought up to some of the kids today was you know do you want a partner is your partner your friend? And are you ready to lose a friend? Because, so those are just things you really got to be careful about if you're gonna uh, start bringing partners into the business. It's gotta be really well defined. Developing those relationships with people you trust is gonna become a very important part of, of, of establishing a business. And, and, and some of those might be suppliers some of those might be customers. Some of those might be teachers that, uh, and professors that are in this room tonight. Uh, that's what John's saying is building those relationships now and it'll take many different forms as you develop your businesses. I, I consider what, what John and I did together, we, we solved mutual problems. He, I've stolen ideas from him and I don't know if he's stolen any ideas from me, but uh, he, you know that's that's what you do. You you uh, come, you share, and uh, I think you've got a great opportunity here to make something that's very unique. Dave and I have talked about um, doing some different types of business together, and um, we still might when we grow up. So mm -hmm. get old enough. <laughs> Uh, well, for me, uh, first of all, it was in personal growth and uh, getting to know who I was and, um, and maturing. Um, it's the, besides that, we, we do export a little bit. Uh, what a, one of those relationships that, that you enjoy as you, as you travel uh, has been immeasurable. John has had more experience than I have with those kind of relationships. He does so much business overseas. but. Uh, I know one, one in particular was uh, working with a, uh, the European golf design uh, company with uh, designing golf courses in Europe and, and uh, wow, what a great experience to be able to go over and play uh, some of these golf courses in, in Europe with him in, uh, in England. So it, is, it offers a lot of opportunities that you would never ever expect to experience otherwise. 
Yeah, I agree. It is fantastic to do business internationally. It is really, really hard to do business internationally, and I understand why many people, many companies choose not to. But we got started when we didn't know any better. And um, we're in 35 countries now. Uh, right now, I've got two young ladies in, in China um, doing, you know, uh, marketing uh, growth. And um, it's, uh, it's um, just been a great experience to be in all the many parts of the world that we've been in. And, and uh, we've got a great, it's all part of that networking. And um, most of our distributors, international distributors, I could say are our friends. Mm -hmm. And we'll g gather in Bologna, Italy, and sit around a table and get silly drinking wine, you know, and it, it's just a lot of fun. So it's been a fantastic, the international business has just been another uh, blessing to our business. No. <laughs> but I've got a lady right over here in the second row that can do it, tell you. I mean, it's, it is absolutely critical. Uh, we've, marketing team works awfully hard at um, uh, the social media and blogging and Facebook and controlling all of that and it is really, really key to your business. I don't care if you're just doing business in Nebraska or around the world. It, it's interesting that we have to market all these different ways. I would say on a, any average day we would be on the phone talking to a customer who has our catalog in front of them designing a seed mix and I said, and when, once you make the sale, would you like to place an order? It says, that's fine, I'll do it online. That is kind of where our business is. You have to be out involved in everything. And that puts a lot of pressure on, on being able to do it right in all those different areas. And so it's, um, if, if you just did it one way or the other, make it so much simpler, but it's, I guess we answered the phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, with that, I'd like to thank you both, John and, or John and Dave, um, and I'd like to have Paul come up and, as a token of our gratitude, give you Angler medals for speaking at our lecture. Time I'm going to get you to bow down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how to react very, to that. Very, very, very <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Paul. <laughs> Great program, David. Great. Thank, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Great You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Let's go again. Great. Program. gentlemen here and that uh, and I have a lot of sensitivity to it because I've talked to you before our group you know in the past about it and that is the is the ethics that are involved in you know in running a good business and to build a reputation because that reputation is something that it, it's impossible to put a value on and uh, and I can assure you if you got a bad reputation it's not too difficult to put you know a devalue that and so that wasn't mentioned here and but but I, I think I'd be safe in saying on behalf of both of these 
two guys I know them pretty well that they do have practice the very best ethics and they have marvelous reputation in their respective fields. And with that, that concludes our, pre our lecture series and there will be a dessert bar afterwards. Thank you all for coming.